once on each tree line. Uh, if it's a corner, there'll be a $300 additional charge around the back. If there's an upstairs, I think it's an extra $100. If it's a residential uh, home, it's a dollar charge per year. So you can imagine in some cases, it can be more expensive than other cases if the stores are larger. So some stores are scared. Reasonably, they're scared. Uh, I am an advocate for it. I am one of the people that believe highly in marketing and advertising your business. The bid is going to do that for us. I don't particularly think that I do too little advertising and marketing. If anybody's seen my ads, you know I advertise a lot. So, you know, I believe that the marketing is a good aspect of the bid, but unfortunately, some of the stores feel that they can't afford it. We need the bid because it's an investment in our future. If we don't do something about the community now, in 10, 20 years, there could be more vacant stores and tumbleweeds going down Tremont. So we need to do something about it now so that that stops and we bring better quality stores back to the community. Thank you. Thank you, John. Now, I participated in Rob's Night Project meeting. I was invited by some of the small, small, small mom and pop owners of Tremont Avenue. They said some intelligent, come to the meeting. I went to one meeting, I went to another meeting, I went to one in Morris Park for this business improvement district. Business improvement district is 6% tax. Who's going to pay 6% tax? The people. 6% tax on their already commercial. Why did they invite me, these property owners? They said, you know, why do we have to pay 6% for cleanup up front, slow removal, and so on and so forth? Why isn't the city, we already pay commercial tax. Why aren't they doing their job? Why do we need a bid? Bid is very simple. Every bid has a district manager. It's about an $80,000 a year job. You know, I get to play mayor of the, of the city, right? Mm -hmm. A little city. I'm the mayor of Throg's Neck, mayor of <laughs> Morris Park at $80,000 a year job. <laughs> Meantime, the milk, the milk and the bread goes up because that small mom and pop store has got to pay $1,500 more or $2,000 more. We went, I was at the last meeting, we discussed this thing, the supermarket on Tremont Avenue. It was an additional eight thousand or twelve thousand. I don't know call the numbers now, but eight or twelve thousand dollars more for this business improvement district. And what did they say? The business improvement district. This attracts franchises. You want franchises because you get rid of the mom and pops. Mom and pops, you got to go and fight every month for the rent. Big franchises like Starbucks, they send you a check from Colorado. You don't have to deal with them. So it's contradictory when people say it's good for the community, but let's bring in franchises. It's good for the business, it's good for the property owners. They don't have to deal with Joe the Butcher or Frank the Fruit Store. You deal with franchises, big corporation, hey. With, as you said, quality stores. Quality stores means franchises. I'm not here to push no mom and pop store out. I'm a mom and pop store. My family's been in mom and pop store. And we support the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jonai. Bob, that's a great question. I come out of small business. My family comes out of small business. I support the bid fully. Matter of fact, I've knocked on doors with you. I made phone calls to make sure that Morris Park is able to become the next bid. I'm working on East Tremont becoming the next bid. Bids are good for the community. They're good for the store owners. They're actually good for the mom and pop shops. They will have a voice. They'll start working together. I support not only the Western Square bid, but I support the Chamber of Commerce. Small business voices have not been brought together. The mom and pop shops that we have that make our commercial corridors so viable, that make our neighborhoods such a great place to live and thrive and raise a family, are the ones that employ locally. And it's a wonderful thing that you can walk out of your home to get a product or a service. The vacancies that we have on East Tremont and City Island and other parts of the Bronx, uh, the other parts of the district, are uncalled for. This borough is a jewel in the rough. Our commercial corridors make our neighborhoods what they are. I will be fighting to support the bids to make sure 
that they link each other up. And someday, our small mom and pop shops will have the voice that they need in city government. That'll happen when I get elected into city council. Thank you. By the way, this bell is for a GDO. Okay, Mr. Gomez. Uh, no, Victor uh, Ortiz. Bids are generally undemocratic. They hurt the poor. But I support it. And I will find a way to, to pass legislation on it. Even though I know it would affect the poor, the people that are struggling. If you look at the administration of the federal government, they just passed laws that are going to affect our health care. And now we got to pay out of pocket for our health care. Right? We got to pay more money for our taxes. They don't raise the rate, but they raise the price of our houses. Right? And so now taxes go up. So they found a loop around. Right? We're being affected and we're, we're being destroyed. The community board allowed these super malls to go up, and that's why those mom and pop stores fell apart. Right? We got a mall in the core city. We got a mall over here in Brazlick. We want to put another mall over there where the White Stone Movie Theater is at. We want to put uh, another, you know, we put a golf course that doesn't pay any taxes or revenue. And we pay the taxes at the end. It comes out of my pocket. It comes out of your pocket, the homeowners. So yeah, the bid is good. Let's rebuild the community. But let's think about why these bids have to be generated. Because the community board and the people in the community board sold out the neighborhood by building these superstores that drew the business into those superstores. I'm sorry to be the real person, the honest politician here, the person, but I will create policies that will benefit everybody. And we need to stop these super malls that are destroying the neighborhood, that are destroying the community. Thank you. Hey, I'm clapping. <laughs> Thank you. And the last response for this question is Mr. John Doyle. I can't pump me and change the mic again, I guess that's fun. I'm deeply hurt, but I'll try to go on. Uh, I just want to thank everybody, and Bobby, it's a good question as to what we do at the bid. And I think sometimes our elected officials, they don't walk in your shoes. So if I was elected councilman, if I was fortunate enough to be in that role, I would walk with you to speak to the owners and support the bid. But the bid is not, I think John and Lisa would agree with this, the bid is not the solution to all our problems. It's a mechanism to address some. And the, frankly, the biggest problem that I have found, uh, you know, 10 years in this community working with people like John and Irene and Skip Giacco out in City Island, is that a lot of the landlords are disengaged. They don't own property. They, they don't, you know, they're not actively engaged in their property. They don't care if it's open. They don't care if it's closed. Again, I touched on the need to support the Small Business Survival Act. It is a tragedy that the Clipper is closing. We've seen this before with the Quality Diner in Pelham Bay. They were closed. Landlords sold them out. They wanted a TV bank. It was ridiculous. I mean, Patty Doherty's, how many people love that? And that thing keeps turning over again and again and again. We don't need that. How many 99 cent stores do we need in this neighborhood? I'm thrilled that when the Taqueria had that fire, they came back. I'm thrilled they came back. I think my campaign staff keeps them in business. But, um, you know, that was a great place. It's a unique place. It's a small mom and pop store. I'm proud that's here in this neighborhood. I eat there all the time. Too much, probably. But... That's what we need to do. We need to support more small businesses. We need to put our money where our mouth is. And as your councilman, the one thing that I would really push for, because the most common concern I get by residents of Throg's Neck, and I'm out there walking doors every day of the week, is that the streets are not cleaned. So the bid can address some of that. Either way, as councilman, I look into the Doe Fund. And I've got to go because it's Christmas time over here. Thank you very much. Again, thank you for those answers, all the uh, candidates here. And excellent questions here, too. A quick question for all of you. How does the body here feel about more questions? Are you still yeah. up for yeah. some? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've only had three questions so far. Ultimately, our president, Lynn Trevino, will decide when the meeting will come to an end. She's the president, okay? <laughs> all right, so let me just see. We had some questions here. Anybody over here? How about if we do this? Next question. Tommy. Okay. And we'll try back there, okay? And when I start, I'm going to start in the middle and go around in a different direction. Hello, my name is Mark Sian. And my question is, how do you feel about City Council James Rockton giving himself a 25% 25 raise, 25 raise in 2009, a third term in 2010, and a 32% raise in 2017? 
playing field of self-dealing hurts our trust in government. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start in the middle and wrap around. We'll start with Mr. Victor Ortiz. Well, I feel that the raise is unjustified. The work is not being done. The legislative duties that he had has not come to fruition, especially in the last couple of years. He's a great person, and I love him personally, but I think he's walked away from the community. Um, as far as the city council, I just feel that um, it's a high paying job, it's hurting us, we have to pay into all the salaries of the city council, and it's incorrect, it's a high, high amount of salary. Um, as far as the work that's put in, um, I don't know if everyone here has put in the work on previous administrations. If you look at 14% of the absent rate by Mr. Mark um, Jonai, He's been absent 14%. So we're going to give him a, pay, a higher raise. He's been 14% excused absence from the job. And now we're going to give him a raise, and now who knows how many absences. Now, if you and I were going to work, and we're absent 14% of the time, what would you do to me? Fight. I'm fired. Right. right? So let's look at that. 14% absence. Now we're going to give him a raise, if he wants, or anybody here on the board. I don't think it's right. 32% of the bills that were proposed, not one passed the House, or, the, or, or passed the legislature, or even the governor signed. And now we're going to give him a raise on top of the raises that you're talking about and the absences that I just mentioned about. And let's look at the reality of the team. I think we have better qualified people here that are gonna do the job, that are gonna be there consistently to do the job and not be absent 14% of the time to do the job. Think about what I'm saying. Hire the right legislator to legislate for your behalf. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent question. And, and I want everyone I want everyone to know in this room, while I only attended one meeting and tracked down to Brooklyn, me and the president of Worcester Square Civic Association, that person, Ms. Delgado, went to about three meetings, maybe four meetings, at the hearings when they were holding these hearings to make to recommend a raise for the city council and went there to object at every one. So I want everyone to give her, her a hand. Please. And as I stated, I was the only one. I went once. Unfortunately, I didn't see any of my fellow members here. I'm not going to point the finger to anyone, please. <laughs> but uh, it's abuse. It's abuse of power. The city council. You might see one bill on the front page of the Bronx Times, which have been at war for the past 40 years. And that's besides the point. One story that the city council passes, or one bill, might be the, how do you clean up the, you know, your dog bill, right? But that one bill, there's 50 other bills for special interest, for lobbyists, for the monies, for the developers, that we don't see. We don't see. I mean, I try to keep track, and I'm, I'm pretty sophisticated about that. And it's all, almost impossible. It's an abuse of power. And I denounced Mr. Vaca at every turn. We went there with 25 people in front of his office and delivered them a big F. A big F for failed, Mr. Vaca, our community. And we do not we need change in this community. Thank you. Well, what we're looking at right now is $148,000 as a salary. And what we're looking at is what can we put into it? What kind of hours are we putting into the work? And holding folks accountable to that, right? As a mathematician, you could average out how many hours in a week that would pay out. We're talking about a position that's a year-round position, and we're, what we're looking at 
doesn't stop Monday through Fridays. This is a Saturday to Sunday. We're looking at being up at the crack of dawn because there's a fire here. There's this that's going on here. This is crime that we need to be accountable for. So yeah, I understand the amount is a long time, but let's average out and see if that person's putting it forward. That's where you hold them accountable with the vote. And what we're seeing too, let's have participatory budgeting here. Let's have you control the money. Where does it go? You have a voice. Let's put it together and say, you know what? Let's fund this. That's what we're looking at. Let's really put our feet and our money where our mouth is and saying, let's fund this. And I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Okay, working our way down to this end of the table, John Serene. <laughs> so I am uh, against uh, the third term that he took, and uh, I'm against the raise that he took. I, uh, I believe that we as elected officials, if we're elected in, should have the ability and the right to, like all elected officials prior to February 2016 in the city council, have the ability to say, okay, I can do more than one thing. And I've been a business owner for over 24 years. Uh, recently, in February 2016, they changed a law that says that if you're a city council member, you cannot have outside source of income except for rental income and uh, being an adjunct professor in college. Now, I own a few businesses. If I win this election, I have to give up. I have to step back and give up, you know, running my businesses. I'm not ashamed to say, and I don't say this to be, to be, in, to gloat or anything, but I think that I would make more money running my business than being the city councilman because I think that they put a cap on it. You know, and it's not right that the, uh, the city council member, he took that raise because there was, the, there was the agreement that you would have to cap your salary there. Now, I'm not saying that city council member deserves hundreds of thousands, but I'm saying that nobody in this room, if your boss said, you work a million hours this year, we're only gonna give you X amount of dollars, you'd say to your boss, you know, go fly a kite. I'm working hard for this money. I deserve every penny I earn. So I, I was very upset when I found out about it because I've been wanting to run for city council for a long time. So to find out that I have to now step back and give up rights to my business does not make me happy. So yes, I'm against the fact that he took the raise and he took the third term. And then uh, he said that, uh, from what I remember, that his mother uh, told him to, uh, to give Bloomberg a third term. <laughs> Uh, Roxana, thank you for the question, and I know you're on the front lines of, of, of these types of government reform issues each and every day. Uh, leadership's about shared sacrifice. If you're going to lead people, you have to lead by example, and actions speak louder than words. Uh, many of you were with me in November of 2015 when I announced that I would be exploring this run, and I said at the announcement that I wouldn't take the pay increase. My father wasn't very happy with me at that. He asked me to try to walk that back at a later uh, event, but uh, it's true because you know what? None of you can give yourselves a 33% pay increase at your jobs. None of you can vote that in. And the fact of the matter is, they have a pay committee that determines the pay for council members, and then city council overran and went over that, which I think was the wrong thing to do. As it relates to the third term, I'm against it because it overrode the will of the people. In the 90s, the people voted for term limits twice. If Mayor Bloomberg or anyone else wants to go and change that, that's fine. Now take it back and bring it back for the will of the people, put it on the ballot, and let the people decide. I think that's very fair. If you disagree with term limits, bring it back and put it on for the people. I support term limits at all branches of government because the corruption, both, uh, well, really, mostly at Albany, has gotten so bad, and I'm speaking in a general term there. Um, again, I think that you lead by example, I would decline the pay increase. I think our cops, our firemen, they can't vote themselves 33% pay increases. And the fact of the matter is where I work every day, Jacoby Medical Center. I'm on a leave of absence right now, but a hundred of my coworkers lost their jobs in the last few weeks. There have been two major cuts in health and hospitals. Our public hospital system is withering on the vine. Someone has to go down there, fight for everyone. The public hospital system treats everyone, no matter who you are, how much money you make, what you look like, where you come from. Someone needs to fight for that, and I will not take the pay increase because I think those the priorities that you need somebody want to sit in Thank you. Roxanne, thank you for the, your question and for your involvement. 
throughout uh, in our community and uh, making sure that the voices of people are heard. I agree with you as well that uh, no one should ever be able to give themselves a raise. I also agree that uh, no one should ever give themselves a third extension, uh, a third time extension, because they will benefit from it. But I do want, and I typically don't do this, but when someone throws out numbers, I need to uh, make sure that the matters are addressed correctly. I have a strong work ethic, seven days a week. I have no problem working 15 hour days. I actually enjoy it and I enjoy what I do. I assure you I did not miss 14%. First off, second off, the days I did miss in 2013 when I got elected, I lost my father, I took him overseas to bury him. 2016, 17, recently, as of two weeks ago, buried Will Madonna, someone that's been with me for five years, took a day because of him. In 2015, I took two days because of an event I had in a public school that I had to be at, that I hosted with third graders. Last year, 2016, not that I keep track of this, seven months, my chief of staff brought to my attention that I had two personal days. That's seven days a week. My family can attest to that. I promise you that I don't take any position I hold for granted. And when it comes to pay decreases, I took a pay decrease when I left the private sector to come into the public sector. I'm not here for the money. I'm here because I care. Thank you. saying what they're doing, what they're not doing. Um, the point is, I thank you for bringing this question up because it makes a lot of sense. Number one, I, I'm going to be honest with you, everyone in here who could give themselves a raise would give themselves a raise, right or wrong? Honestly, was it correct? I don't think so. Um, do I think they, they should have held back and, and allowed the people to make that decision? Yes. Again, let's go back to holding our elected officials accountable. Do we need a third term for a, a mayor or a city council member or an assemblyman? No. So I think we need to put term limits across the board. So he, Mr. Jonah might say that he's not giving himself a third term, but he's actually giving himself a third term and he's actually giving himself a raise. Well, maybe a sixth or a seventh. And regardless, he's going to get to keep his seat that he promised to serve for the next two years. Or maybe he might not, and he'll give it to someone else in the community. Um, but he, he sounds like he's running for mayor, not for city council. And at the end of the day, what is his legacy? But let's, let's, let's put that aside. The point is, if, if you, if you want to elect someone, elect someone who's going to serve the people, who's going to speak for the people, who's going to care about what the people's input is. So yes, we do need participatory budgeting and put it back on the people. We, if I was elected, honestly, and, I'm, and I don't say this because I want to say it or look sound good, I would give that 25% as a donation to a cause in the community, something that's not being serviced, whether it's a, a center for children or for seniors or, or to give back to the police and the firemen or even to the teachers, that's what I would do with that money. And I would give it as a donation every year, 25% of my salary. I don't need the increase because I, I love what I do right now and I'm okay. I don't need the 148,000. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to see all this interest and passion here. Just a commentary. I know everybody here is gonna vote in September. Woo! Far too few people use that privilege in our society. Please vote. Now, I have a note from our uh, officers that we're going to go for two more questions. Obviously, each question is um, several minutes long. And as a point of order, Lynn, I'm going to mention to remind the audience here that if you wish to direct your question to a specific candidate, please do so. But out of fairness to the rest, we'll then allow others who want to respond to that as well to do so. Now, I had recognized Mr. Acosta, 
and one more ladies in the back. It'll be a hard decision because they're both beautiful. So, <laughs> but Tommy, you're beautiful too. Okay. <laughs> Tommy. Hi. Uh, I'm also on Tom Mallow on Community Board 10, Economic Development Chair. Um, I heard a lot of promises. I want to know who's got a plan, not just a promise. City Council has let us down with a couple of things. How many people have homes here? Every. You can imagine everything, right? We were promised water meters. We're going to lower our water meters. We're going to lower our water. We're going to be able to not be lower than what. Uh, my water bill is through the roof. My taxes are through the roof. My services are not being addressed. But my taxes and my water bill is going through the roof. Who's got a plan to help us with that? Even the businesses. The reason why businesses go out of business is they're taxed to death, their water bills to death. Everything is, is, is on top of us. We need grid. Uh, the reason why we have no parking is because before they should have downsized, they should have downsized 10 years ago. They saw this coming. They didn't do it. So I want to know who's got a plan to do this, not just a promise, a plan. And you got to understand another thing, too. In Community Board 10, there was two candidates here that said that we sold the community out, that we voted to put all these uh, things. Community Board 10 didn't do that. Community Board fought like crazy to block this. We don't have that kind of power, okay? It was the people in the council that let this go by, not Community Board 10. So if these guys here told you Community Board 10 did that, they don't know what they're talking about. Thank you, Tommy. And Tommy, I'm very sorry, I mispronounced your last name. It's Tommy Accomando. They said they cost us a fork. Did everybody get the question? Okay, good. Uh, is this directed to all the candidates? Anyone could answer. I'll start randomly. I like what you said. Say that again. I'm the best qualified to address it. Say that loud again. I'm the best qualified to address the community. Endorsement. He's got a, my first endorsement, folks. <laughs> Come on, though. I, I, first of all, I want to applaud the service you give to community board 10 and other board members here. And I, as you know, I was a former board member myself, not in this district. But I served the community board for 12 years. And we do put a lot of time into it. And unfortunately, sometimes we do get blamed for things that uh, people perceive that it's our fault. And you're right. Community board is an advisory at times. And, uh, but unfortunately, I've always took in the position of community board, and this is why I attend Basically, I'll probably attend more meetings than even board members. In fact, our recent meeting, our recent uh, general meeting, we brought in homeowners, I think we have a few of them, that lived in the back of Maine in Puerto Rico. Because community board 10, while they're not at fault, as you said, I say the opposite. They're at fault for allowing the destruction of Crocs Neck, East Tremont Avenue, turn it into a lounge. Every place is a lounge. In City Island, the community board has been advocating. I've been to meetings two years ago. We had people from Miles Avenue complaining about Costco. I complained two years ago about Havana. And they said, you're picking on the Spanish clubs. What happened to the Irish and Italian uh, restaurants? And I said, those are not the problems. Some of the old board members were attacking me for even standing up to the board. So don't call me a Mr. Innocent, and the board will call me a Mr. Innocent, because we do have a few bad apples, and I've asked them to resign. And thank God some of them have resigned. Thank you. Right. Right. He's telling you, Frank, right where he's at. We need term limits in the community board, too. These people here are long members running the show for all the special interest groups. I'm sorry to say. They're selling out and they have sold out. Look at all the uh, malls, look at the golf courses, and all the other massive stuff. Hurricane Sandy came, didn't he? Advocate, didn't he? Fix the neighborhood. FEMA didn't come. 
the neighborhoods in Miles Avenue have like 26 potholes. Behind Sweeney's, the street has never been paved. Right? Everybody in, in, in Miles Avenue, that area's a mess. The communities in, in, in City Island are going crazy from April 1st to September 1st. It's a disaster. The people can't get in. I'm the only one that advocated an HOV lane to let the people go in. The people from um, the other side, by uh, the, they have the same traffic disasters. The community board needs to be shut down, rebuilt, and fixed. The city council membership here, one of us has to, one of us, other than Mark, has to represent you. Mark doesn't have any attendance, I'm sorry to tell you. He's a great politi looking politician, but I'm sorry, he doesn't know how to legislate, doesn't know how to make the bills happen into law. All of us here are going to do the job, I'm sorry. One of the other people here could do the job better. We will go to work. You go to work. You're late, whatever. I one last thing I just want to say. I lost my uncle to colon cancer. I lost my mother-in-law, and I lost a couple of other people. I still went to work in Stanford, and I still attended, and I did my job, and I came back and I buried my family. There's no excuse. You're a public servant, and you have to do your job. Thank you, Victor. Ellis. Thank you so much. Um, I, I said this earlier today, and I'm going to say it again. Follow the money. If you want to really know who's on that community board, uh, there's people on that community board that actually are uh, some of these uh, business owners. And if you don't believe me, go to one of those meetings, uh, and, and you'll see them there. They're sitting there. They're part of that community board, and they will advocate for their businesses. So that's part of the problem. The problem is also that the elected official who's been in office for 12 years, and you can say it all you want, but I can point them out for you, I can name them for you, okay? The problem is that one of us up here actually owns a nightclub, okay? I'm not gonna call it a nightclub because he calls it a restaurant, but it's a nightclub, okay? And it happens to be in City Island. So who is really advocating for the people of the community? And who is going to advocate for the business owners who are destroying the community? Ask yourself that question. Follow the money. I also want to just make an announcement. I think that the, that the comments that are made back there are very disrespectful to everyone that's up here and to everybody that's here today. So if you want to hold your comment about Mark or about your candidate, with all due respect, I would ask that you would refrain from making comments because it's offensive to everybody that's up here who's giving their all. And I think it's also offensive to those people who have respected you guys as well. And my point is, I think this is about us as a community, not about me as a politician or about my pockets or how I'm going to benefit from it. So again, if you want change in the community, you do need to change the process of how people are elected on the community board and who is making the decisions at City Hall. And that happens because of the elected officials that were in place for the last 12 years. And Mr. Jones is one of those elected officials. Thank you. Marjorie? Nobody's, answer, nobody's addressed I, I the taxes answer, and the water bill. The they picked on the community board. As, as a Democratic <laughs> district leader of and a member of the executive board in the Chippewa Democratic Club, we actually held uh, a meeting where we sat with DEP and said, how are you guys doing this? What are we doing? And at that time, we were expecting a, a water rebate. However, oddly enough, a special interest group for wealthy landlords came in and sued the city to stop from you, homeowner, to get that rebate. Because they wanted a piece of their, you know, share because they don't have enough money. And we need to fight back. And we need to fight back against candidates that accept money from those special interest groups. And we need to unite together and say, we want this water, uh, water rebate back on the table. I look forward to telling Bill de Blasio to his face and saying, I'm going to join you in this. We're going to fight against RSA on this. We're going to fight against the revenues of the world. And those are two special interest groups that hold the interest of only wealthy landlords. 
we got to fight together. And when we're looking at property taxes, we got to make sure that the assessments are correct. We got to stop overbilling on our families here because we're displacing our own families that have invested their whole lives here. That's what we got to go back and say, no, you're going to fix this. And I have, like I said, I have no problem calling people out. I have no problem letting people hear my voice. And I'm here to stand to be the best. Mark July. Thank you, sir. As you can see, I'm getting a lot of love. <laughs> it's part of the game, but it's fine. Great. I want to ask, answer your question. First of all, I do want to say to you that I praise anyone that gives their personal time to serve in a community where God bless you for doing it. The fact of the matter is, the mayor has lied to us again. He lied to us on the double digit water and sewer rate increases that he said would not happen under his administration, and he's lied about the real estate tax increases. You're being forced out of your home because of the city policies that we have on overtaxation. Your water rates are now more expensive than your fuel costs. When we had the recession, there was a surcharge that was added onto one to three family homes by Bloomberg. It was nearly 10% increase in your real estate taxes. And that was to make up for the recession and the deficit the city had. That money, that was supposed to be reversed. On the Bloomberg, it was a pledge. The Blasio promised to reverse it. He didn't live up to his word. He didn't live up to his word that he would not be raising water and sewer rates. I've been a proponent of 2% real estate tax increases. If it's good enough for the rest of the state, it should be good enough for New York City, and I promise you that's what I'll do in the City Council. We'll reevaluate real estate taxes, we'll lower water and sewer rates, and we'll make sure that those that can't afford to pay for it, increases in taxes do so, but not at the cost of the back of you, the homeowner. Thank you. Let's start with the economic point of your question, because we could go into the community board thing all night, but for most people it's inside baseball. Um, Tom, I invite you to go to my website, shameless plug, johndoyle.nyc. You see detailed plans on everything I talk about. It's one of the things that I like to do. Um, but one thing is it relates to water bills. The issue with the water bill is that we don't incentivize conservation. You're paying for aqueducts and water mains that they're building into Manhattan right now. That's why your water bill is so high. You're paying for capital construction costs. That's wrong. We need to go back to a system that incentivizes conservation. It should be that if you spend, if you, if you use over 500 gallons, your, your cost thereafter balloons up because we want to encourage conservation. If you save water, you should see your bill go down. I'm committed to changing the system and working on that. We're going to have to work with the state legislature to do that. As it relates to property taxes, this is a unique beast, but it has not been clear. And the fact of the matter is, is that we tell you we've kept your property taxes stagnant, but then what we do is we change your assessment, which in the end is just raising your property taxes. It's a game. What we need is a fully transparent system where you know and understand what's going on. There's no reason that Vic DiPiero and Country Club is paying double what the mayor's paying down in Brooklyn. That's absolutely absurd. It should, if it's good enough for Park Slope, it should be good enough for Country Club. Um, as, it relates to the community, as it relates to the community board, uh, I'm going to say things that maybe some people don't want to hear. Maybe you're one of them. Listen, there, there were some problems at community board time. The chair was voted out and the district manager was removed. That's just the facts of the matter. Uh, what I would try to do to be positive is to reassess who's appointed, work with the borough president in that regard. I would try to get people who are either on a community association, on a, a veterans group, on a merchant association, AARP, PTA. I have three simple, question, uh, three simple uh, responsibilities for them. One, I want you to listen. That's number one. I want you to listen to your neighbors. Two, I want you to research the issues before you vote on them. And three, I want you to obey the law. Thank you. So, uh, so to answer your question, uh, you know, I, I'm an accountant. I've been in the accounting industry for close to 30 years now. I believe that it takes somebody like an accountant to scrub through the books to figure out where is the city wasting our money. People ask this question all the time, where are they wasting the money? Well, until you see the books, it's going to be almost impossible to figure it out. But I guarantee you that we can cut things that are being spent uh, on, uh, incorrectly throughout the city budget, and then we can do things like lower the real estate taxes. I don't know if you guys are aware, but the New York City uh, real estate taxes 
uh, the senior citizen star exemption recently, many seniors lost it, completely lost it, because the city said that if the seniors made more than $37,399, including their Social Security and pension, IRA and everything, that they would lose it. And this is ridiculous. Seniors have doubled their real estate taxes. They cannot afford, they're on a very fixed budget. We need to figure out how is it that de Blasio is only paying $3,100 for his $1.5 million house, and then somebody in the Drogs Neck or Pelham Bay or any other community in our district is paying close to $6,000. When our assessments, I know my assessments, $442,000. How does that make any sense? Is if you knock down the house, the land is not worth more than what it is in Brooklyn. Definitely not. So, you know, we need to figure that out. And, uh, and you know, the thing, other questions you ask, like uh, the, the real estate taxes going up for the business owners and the landlords is putting people out of business. That takes us back to the bid. Now, the bid would increase business for the community, for the business owners. That would increase revenue for the business owners and they can stay in business. The bid is definitely something good for the, for the community. Um, and uh, one last thing, as an accountant, it really, really frustrates me that we are one of the only cities, there's very few cities throughout the United States that pay a city tax. They actually have the nerve to call it a luxury tax because we live in the five boroughs. Why do we have to pay so much tax? They say, well, people upstate New York, they pay a lot of uh, real estate taxes, but they don't pay the city tax that we pay. So we have to figure out a way to cut our city tax so that we can start saving money. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. And Dr. Old asked question. Now, obviously there are many people with other questions here. Would I be correct in saying that uh, if anyone would like to speak one-on-one -on -one with any of the candidates, they may do so after the meeting? Okay, so they will do that if you like. Now, I'm in a bit of a dilemma here. There's two young ladies here who might be out. I'm going to try something now. If you come up this way, both of you. I'm taking a gamble with this lady. All right, now Lynn says one more question, so I'm going to think of a number. It's in my mind between one and ten. What's the number? Seven. Seven, thank you. Sorry. Okay. I was going to have them both put a question in. But anyway, you can ask your questions loud Thank you. Um, I'm here from Edgewater Park. I represent 675 homes. We are being crushed by FEMA by DEC, by house insurance, we are sliding from a middle class community to a low class community. We are being dumped on. Locust Point has a bridge dumping pollution on them. We have the DEP dumping pollution into the Weir Creek. We are afraid to ask for help. We get no money and no support because we are supposedly a private community. I want to know who is going to help me because I will not stop. I want to know who is going to recognize our community and help us because we need help. And I'm going to say this, Jimmy Vanka has helped us. And I am grateful to the people that volunteer in their community, on community boards, as local citizens and activists helping their little communities and getting nothing in return. Thank you, thank you. And let us start from left to right as we start at the beginning with Mr. John Serini. So I definitely agree. Uh, as an insurance broker, I can tell you that there's people in uh, Edgewater Park and Locust Point, Silver Beach that are paying astronomical amounts of flood insurance that they can't sell those homes because people can afford the mortgage, they just can't afford the flood insurance. Home insurance is a fraction of what the flood insurance is. So we need the representatives, whoever whoever's elected, to work together with our Senate, with our Congress, with FEMA, to do something about this flood insurance. Senator Klein recently had appointed me to a special counsel for homeowners, and I went down to the uh, New York State Insurance Department. I was proud that he picked me as a local community broker. I know that the, uh, the home insurance industry and the flood insurance industry is out of control, but we need to work on the seawalls. You know, your seawalls are collapsing. It's a, it's a horrible thing that people who invest so much money into their homes is, are now scared that the seawalls are going to cause destruction to their property. You should not have to go through that. So we need elected officials that are going to do something about all of these problems that you're having. I know that could be me. I hope that you guys can uh, vote for me on election day. Thank you. Well, 
I definitely echo what John said and the need to work together. And sometimes you've got to check your party label at the door and do what's right for the people. Um, as it relates to FEMA, DEC, you know, I've had experience with kind of all these agencies. As a matter of fact, I used to have to deal, John and I used to have to deal with a lot of people in Inchwater and along the uh, Eastchester Bay seaboard who got their insurance cut by, by many different insurance companies as a result of Hurricane Katrina. For some reason, they, they kept the policies there and dropped them up here just to kind of clear their books. Um, as it relates to Edgewater, you know, I think I've done a lot in Edgewater working with your board. They're fantastic. Uh, I know that uh, as it related to New York Rising, we were able to get money to make the firehouse handicap accessible. I think that's a clear way that we can be helpful. I know we're also going to harden a lot of the um, a lot of the electrical systems, and I think that was money we got through the governor uh, to do those things. So that was very helpful. Uh, listen, climate change is real, and it's here, folks. I, I'm going to make that clear to everybody. Uh, and we need to address ways to make that happen. One thing I'm very serious about is taking the top climate people down at City Hall, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, bringing you, Debbie, because you're right, you're tenacious, and I thank you for it, uh, and bringing them along our seaboard. I want to see Birmingham over here, because you know what, everybody? Had Sandy, had the tides been in the other direction, our neighborhoods would have gotten very, very hurt by what happened there. I live in a, in, a, in a coastal community. I know it well, and I know that we have so much more to do. We have not done enough, and that's going to be one of my main causes, the environment and climate change, and making sure that residents like Edgewater Park are protected, and going down there on Build It Back and telling Bill de Blasio he hasn't built it back. Thank you very much. What is another jewel that we have in the Throgs Neck area? Those homers out there uh, truly are a fortunate community that we should be living amongst them. I've been out there, I've seen your issues, and I heard your issues. We've discussed them. It's not only the flood insurance that's twice as much or expensive as your homeowner's insurance, your firehouse, you have a volunteer firehouse out there. For those of you that have never been out there, that's an incredible community. Those 600 plus homes make up a real family unit, and I think that uh, they don't get the credit that they deserve. Because of your waterfront uh, property, proximity to the water, you have been, unfortunately, been overlooked for a long, long time. We did a survey. On your table, you see a survey that one out of every three homes, a 33% of homes, don't feel they're ready for the next uh, Hurricane Sandy. That's unfortunate. We haven't built back your homes, let alone come up with ways to protect from further damage. I assured you then, and I'll show you again now, I'm in a unique position. I'll be working alongside Senator Jeff Klein and Michael Benedetto and Congressman Crowley to make sure, collectively, we address the issues at Edgewater Park. You have, we discussed not only the seawall that needs to be addressed, but the piers that have to be rebuilt, that the new generation, the next generation, will not be able to afford the same growing up experience that you did. We're gonna be there for you, I promise you. I'm a proud homeowner here in Crogsnick and um, actually, like I said, moved in about seven years ago into my home. And one of the first challenges I faced was the fact that the area where I live at and where I own is a flood area or flood zone. So my flood insurance has, year by year, has gone up. It's gotten to the point where I pay more for flood insurance than I do for, for homeowner's insurance. So I know the, the struggle, I know how difficult it is to, to, to work and pay these bills, pay for these water taxes that continue to go up. And, but the problem, again, goes back to those people who were elected. It goes back to those people who have been representing these areas. Mr. Jones just said that he'll work with these people, but these people haven't done anything for you. And, I, and you could debate that all night and say, yes, Mr. Vaca has helped, and yes, he does go out there and promote. But at the end of the day, is he really just taking a picture, or is he really doing something for Edgewater Park? Is, is Mr. Klein really doing anything for, for, for Edgewater Park, is he, or is he really doing something? So I, I, would, I, would, I would question that, uh, and I would, I, would, I would question that carefully, and I would say if it's good for, for him, then it has to be good for everyone else, because I'm pretty sure that, that on his salary, on his dime, he could afford it, but some of us here are struggling to get by, and that homeowner's insurance and that uh, flood insurance is way too high. And we need to do something about it. But it starts with the people who are elected in these uh, positions. 
here in Dogs Net in, in District Council 13. So I, I, I would ask you to think about that. I do have a plan. Go to alexgomez.nyc and you'll find out that I do want to reduce property taxes and business taxes. And I really want to create opportunity for small businesses to thrive and to hire locally. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I think I'm the most qualified to answer your question. New Orleans was flooded and they brought non for profits in like Habitats of Humanity to redesign the structures of the houses and the people there got a tax abatement to rebuild their homes. And that is the policy that I would present when I'm the city council member for your community, for Locust Point, for City Island. Because we live on the water. I live on Miles Avenue, Pennyfield Camp, 100 feet from the water. Hurricane Kisandi came. When I looked to the left, you guys were on the water. And Klein and the congressman and Vodka didn't show up. Not even, they didn't know, not my area. No, they didn't. I'm sorry, they didn't. Because I went to the community board and I asked him to come over, but they didn't show up. I had to run to your firehouse to speak to FEMA to get the, remember FEMA was in your firehouse? And I went to your firehouse to get some money. And you know what they said? We're gonna give you $28,000 to rebuild your house, but we're gonna charge you whatever, 0.8% on it for 30 years. That was the solution? No, the solution was to bring a non-for-profit in. The solution was to redesign the houses in that community, in Locust Point, to raise the, the buildings up higher, above sea level, because they're at sea level. And so when the hurricane came, that was six feet, 10 feet above, everything was flooded. So now you have to raise the houses, just like New Orleans. You have to give the money to those families to help them pay. You need to bring and provide jobs in this community to build and to rebuild so that we can survive the next hurricane. I'm going to bring the policy to your neighborhood, to Locust Point, to City Island, that's going to make it happen, that's going to give you the money that you need to rebuild. I don't hear it here. They don't have the policy I do. Thank you. I'm sorry to take a little longer, but that is personal to me because I live in the water too. Thank you. Obviously, we all feel the same way. We all want to help Edgewater Cross. We want to help City Island. We want to help Locust Point. We know there was a problem. Uh, 20, uh, 2012. 2012, Sandy hit. Everyone was on uh, Pennyfield Avenue, right? All the water coming in and hitting the other areas. But that's five years ago. I mean, I've been to numerous meetings. I've seen you at numerous meetings. We've talked to other agencies. We have FEMA. We've had this. We've had that. And unfortunately, the policy, as the gentleman said, is the problem here. Five years later, we're still dealing with the same problem. And so, who do we put the blame on? Okay, fine. You don't want to blame Klein, you don't want to blame Benedetto, Vaca, or did I forget it? Crowley. We don't want to blame them. But five years later, we still have the same problem. So, there is a policy issue here. Did the governor take the money from the federal government, put it in a big fund, and put a bureaucracy on it? He sure did. He sure did. We know where that money went. They disappeared. The federal government, you know, saw that money, they just kissed their goodbye when Cuomo grabbed it. Right. And, and all the legislators who put it into, who channeled it <laughs> and tunneled it into their little pet projects mm -hmm. that we don't hear about. Do you know how many little pet projects Sandy created? It, it would blow your mind to, to understand where all this money went. But obviously Edgewater did not have their problems resolved. And... And like all the rest of the candidates here, obviously, if I'm elected, we're going to get to the bottom of it. I want to see where that money went. There was a wall allocated for some of you there, which didn't make sense. They left this whole side, the northeast side open. Open. Why did they do some of you? Because they wanted to channel the manufacturing area there, the creek. But they said City Island and all of Country Club, Locust Point, and it's what a Hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> We're going to get the money back from Cuomo. Yeah. From the left hey. Right. And the last candidate, last but not least, Marjorie Velasquez. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> uh, she had mentioned that I am the only lady here. Yes, I am. Um, but I've had the privilege of sitting with the Edgewater Board. I've also had the privilege of knocking at doors and meeting the different families. And as you all know, our district actually has a lot of waterfront properties. And a lot of folks are affected by this rising insurance costs. So it's talking about what can we do? It's uniting all the civics together and working with the insurance companies to provide a discount for all our families. It's working together. That's something that I propose and I've been working with the different insurance agencies on right now. What we're also looking at is when we're looking at building the seawall back, we use our local neighbor first. We give jobs to our families first that's where it starts. We can't displace our families anymore. Our money has to come here first. So when you're going to build here in our area, District 13, you're going to have to hire from here first. Then we can talk about what you're going to do elsewhere. But we have to bring back the jobs. We have to actually bring back fixing our own, because this is a beautiful community. 675 homes. That's what makes Edgewater unique, because everyone takes care of each other. But you know what? Let's expand that. Let, let us all take care of each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before I hand the mic back to Lynn, who will uh, conduct the raffle, our president, I just want to say thank you to Lynn on behalf of the other offices for organizing this. Probably most of you don't know it because she didn't tell many people, but she was not feeling well. She just had her gallbladder out. I think it's great that she came out tonight to be here for this whole thing. Yeah. That's why she's sitting here. Secondly, we'd like to thank all of you for your questions uh, and being here just to listen. We invite you to any of our meetings in the future. We'll be starting again in September. And uh, we are a community working together. Obviously, we have many different viewpoints and ideas and stuff, but we're all together. I would ask you to uh, give an applause individually as I call out their names for each of our candidates. Mr. John Cerini. Mr. John Doyle. Mr. Mark Jonai. Should we have an applause here like they had in Sydney years ago? Mr. Alex Gomez. Mr. Victor Ortiz. <laughs> Mr. Edigio Sanitilli. <laughs> and Marjorie Velasquez. <laughs> and also thank you to uh, Lucia Giraldi. Who is here over. seven best new friends tonight to be here. Do you think you gentlemen and lady are going to hear bells in your dreams tonight as you sleep? All right, I'd like to hand this back over to Lynn Gravino, our president. Thank you, Jack. How about a round of applause for Jack? He's a great job. He did a great job. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the candidates. Thank you, community, for coming. You'll get to see who the candidates are, what they stand for. Remember to go and vote in September. And now, Rob Barbarelli is going to go the raffle. I know, like Okay, seven, seven, three, seven, five, one, eight. Seven, seven, three, seven, five, one, eight. Seven seven three seven five six four.